millions in ransom is paid, the kidnappers are caught, the money is found, and the victim is alive. Thank God you're here, and I'd like to have a cigarette. Those were the first words 68-year-old Harvey Weinstein said when he was rescued. The millionaire businessman was buried alive for almost two weeks in a 14-foot pit located at 157th Street and Edgecombe Avenue in Upper Manhattan. He was reportedly only fed fruit and water. Today, he was recovered alive. Detectives searching for Mr. Weinstein in that area this afternoon climbed a steep hill calling his name. Finally, they heard a response, I'm here. But they couldn't find the exact location. Digging through the dirt with their hands, they uncovered a plywood plank with a steel door held down by cinder blocks. Police say the kidnapping began after Weinstein finished breakfast at the Mark Twain Diner on Northern Boulevard in Queens. He did it for about five, six years. Uh, that's what I know of the guy, that's all. Every day comes and has breakfast? Uh, quite often, yes. Weinstein always stopped at the diner before going to his tuxedo company, Lord West Formal Wear, which is a few blocks from the diner. Weinstein was abducted somewhere between the diner and his business. His family reported him missing soon after his kidnapping. On the morning of August 5th, they got their first call. This is the Black Cat organization. We have Harvey Weinstein. Over the past 11 days, there have been 50 telephone calls between the family and the kidnappers. On two occasions, kidnappers left four photographs of Mr. Weinstein and a tape of his voice urging the family to pay the ransom. Finally, at 6 o'clock this morning, the money was dropped at 190th Street and Amsterdam Avenue. As we were uncovering the earth, he said, who are you? We said, we're the police. And he says, hold my hand. And it was eerie because up out of the dirt came four fingers. And I just grabbed his hand. He said, thank God, thank God. A sewing machine operator at Weinstein's company has been arrested in connection with the kidnapping. Furman Rodriguez was picked up by the cops along with Antonio Rodriguez. Both men are related. Now $3 million in now, $3 million in cash was paid. Uh, all of it was recovered. The New York Post knew of the kidnapping. It held the story, and the police commissioner and the mayor both congratulated the newspaper, saying that it believes the newspaper may have saved Weinstein's life by holding on to the story and not reporting it. Reporting live from the Upper East Side, I'm Penny Crone, Fox News. Now back to you, John. All right, thanks, Penny, for the proof why New York's finest is called New York's finest. And John, tonight's other top story right now, a flood warning is in effect for Manhattan and Hudson County, New Jersey. So far, the torrential rains have resulted in some pretty ugly flooding, grinding subway service on the west side to a halt. Linda Schmidt is standing by right now at the 72nd and Broadway tracks with details for us. Linda? Well, thank goodness. The problem actually is starting to clear up. We're at the 72nd and Broadway subway station where the number three and the number one lines were down up until about 30 seconds ago. And if you look over here to the left of me, you can see the number three line. It's just whizzing by right now. But moments ago, it was sitting idle and it had been sitting idle for about two hours. Now that torrential rainfall earlier today it just really caused a mess at a lot of the subway stations. Take a look at some of the video from earlier this evening. Many of the people were showing up here at the subway station trying to get onto the subways to get to their destination, but they were unfortunately being turned away and being rerouted to take other forms of uh, mass transportation. Workmen have been working on the lines for the last several hours, and uh, many of the trains, like I said, were stuck. Now, the areas that have been impacted are the A-line trains running northbound between 34th and 59th streets are stopped, as is all service on the 1, 2, and 3 lines in both directions. However, as I just told you a couple of seconds ago, the number 1 and the number 3 lines in some sections here in Manhattan are back online again. Uh, there's also some flooding on the tracks between 79th and 86th Street stations and at the South Ferry Station. And the one, tra uh, the one train was actually stuck here at uh, the 72nd and Broadway subway, the number one and the number three lines. Also, there were many closings in the uh, Queens area. However, those are also back online. So this really caused a major problem, that torrential rainfall. We definitely needed the rain, but the commuters tonight did not want to see that rain. It really caused a lot of havoc for many of them. Many of them had to be removed from the trains because they got stuck because many of the tunnels a couple of blocks from where we 
are now were flooded and the trains could not get through. But as I told you, the number one and the number three lines in this area are back in service and workmen are continuing to work on the remainder of the uh, lines and expect them online relatively soon. For now, reporting live at the 72nd and Broadway subway, I'm Linda Schmidt. Back to you. Thank you very much, Linda. And there's more. The subway is not the only area bearing the brunt. Flooded roadways, including the FDR Drive, causing massive headaches for drivers tonight. Bill Schwartz is standing by right now at the Weather Center with more on all this rain. Phil. Cora, and it did come down fast and furious. Just a little bit earlier tonight, we saw a cluster of thunderstorms move across the area. We saw as much as two inches of rain in just a matter of an hour and a half. That's more rain than we saw during the entire month of July, and we saw that in just a matter of an hour and a half. And if you were outside when it was coming down, you know what a mess it created. We did see a lot of localized street flooding. Uh, many areas that usually flood obviously did flood uh, during this evening. If you were outside, you don't have to have me tell you that it was coming down in buckets. Now, the heaviest of the showers and thunderstorms, as we can see on radar, is beginning to move out of the picture. You can see it moving off out to sea. However, see that train-like echo? That's what we call it, going back across New Jersey from New Brunswick all the way up into Pennsylvania. And what happens is these thunderstorms just travel right along that track. So we could see some more heavy showers and thunderstorms throughout the night, especially from New York City southward. I think that's where the heaviest rain could occur. And we could see a couple of more inches of rain before all is said and done sometime tomorrow morning. We'll have more on that a little bit later on. John? All right, see you later then, Phil. One of the uh, one of the two teenagers charged with killing Michael Jordan's father says he didn't kill him. His name is Daniel Green, and he may have helped the police recover a key piece of evidence. Dan Placco reports from North Carolina, where the accused killers faced a judge. Charges murder with malice of forethought, then kill and murder James Jordan, owner of... Both teenage suspects sat motionless as the judge read the murder charges. Dan Green maintained a stony silence throughout the hearing, while his childhood friend, Larry Demery, at times looked as though he was on the verge of tears. Security was tight as spectators packed the courtroom, and outside the courthouse, scores more gathered to get a first-hand look. The two men accused of perhaps the most sensational crime in this rural county's history. I came to show my support for Michael. Police continue to tie up the loose ends in this case, today announcing that they'd found a critical piece of evidence. We did recover the Chicago Bulls ring. The Bulls' 1991-92 championship ring, like this one, was a gift from Michael Jordan to his father. James Jordan was wearing the ring the night Demery and Green allegedly shot and killed him as he rested along this state highway. And now police have found the ring in the suspect's custody, apparently hidden outside the county. And that uh, links the defendant to Mr. Jordan, the victim. Again today, the suspect's families refuse to talk about the case. I may have something to say a little earlier, later. Uh, or anything you folks get want to say. Get away from me! That's what I want to say. Get away from me! And when we were able to get close to suspect Dan Green... Anything you'd like to say about the charges? He doesn't have anything that's up. One of the attorneys did speak today, raising the question, can they get a fair trial in Michael Jordan country? It's a little early to tell. I don't think there's anywhere from here to the West Coast that hasn't had a lot of publicity. And we are now live in Lumberton, North Carolina, in front of the county jail where the two suspects in James, Mor uh, James Jordan's murder are staying tonight and will be staying apparently for quite some time. The reason for that, we're told, is that the uh, judge refused to offer bond, saying that there's simply too great a risk to run. They both have criminal records and they both could get the electric chair if convicted of this crime. John, back to you. Hey, just a quick question. Do you know if these two uh, are in protective custody or did they mix them in with some of the other inmates? According to what we've been able to learn, they're mixing them in with the other inmates. Now, this is not a very busy jail. This is a county of only 100,000 or so people, a fairly rural area, so there aren't too many people in here. But they are getting special uh, care, and they are being watched over very closely. All right, thanks, Dane, for that report. Corian? Joel Rifkin's attorney says there is no way he can get a fair trial on Long Island because all of the publicity surrounding the serial murder investigation. He wants the trial moved. Rifkin is the East Meadow man charged in one murder but linked to as many as 17 others. Rifkin was not at today's pretrial hearing, but family members of his alleged victims were. They do not care where the trial takes place, but they are happy that Rifkin's attorney is not getting his way on a request to lump all the charges against Rifkin into one trial. Sort of a package deal.
He did not kill them in a package. He killed them one by one, and he should be tried one by one. Mrs. Alonzo told reporters that she often stomps on a photo of Rifkin to lessen the pain of her daughter's death. Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman lost another round in his fight to stay here in the U.S. A federal judge agreed with an earlier ruling that the Sheikh can be deported, and he rejected a request to release him from prison. Some of the Sheikh's followers were charged in the World Trade Center bombing and the plot to bomb the U.N. He has 10 days to appeal the deportation. Well, imagine being a woman and pregnant and your doctor tells you you have tested positive for the AIDS virus. For weeks you live in nightmare until you're told it was all a mistake. That's exactly what happened to two women tested for AIDS at a hospital in Brooklyn. As Rosanna Scott reports, hospital officials are scrambling for answers. Lutheran Medical Center's operation is being put under a microscope after staff told two pregnant women they tested positive for the AIDS virus. Only weeks later did they learn there was a foul up. When we went to the Brooklyn Hospital's press conference, we couldn't even get our cameras inside, let alone get a straight answer. The thing is, if it's a press conference, then my camera should be allowed inside oh, to see so why and don't photograph you, what's Ms. going Scott, on. Why don't you just, because you don't, we don't allow the cameras in at the moment, why don't you just uh, either stay right here, I just have to make a couple of phone calls. The city's health department, which runs the laboratories where the blood is tested, was not taking the blame. Any error that was made was made in specimen handling, and we are highly confident that the extent, extensive series of checks that we have at the Bureau of Laboratories eliminates the possibility of specimen mishandling by the department. We want to reassure New Yorkers that the test itself is extremely uh, accurate, that it appears at this early stage in the investigation what has happened is that we have a sampling, uh, sample mishandling. The two pregnant women found out they were misdiagnosed after going to Dr. Joseph O'Connell's private clinic for a retest. While they were waiting for results, one of the women reportedly contemplated an abortion. The other's husband thought about suicide. It was interesting that the men felt as guilty in terms of that they infected their wives, and they couldn't understand how. And the one gentleman uh, was, he said, I can't believe I'm going to kill myself. I don't believe this. That I, I, How can I affect my wife? You know, my beautiful wife, she's pregnant. We want to have a family. The health department says they did their own retesting and found the misdiagnosis. They have the original paperwork and blood samples to investigate the mishap. The hospital is said to be cooperating fully, but no one from their laboratory would talk to us. You, you work in the laboratory, right? No. You, I see you have a laboratory task on. You want to say it again? The health department admits there could be other fouled up test results, so they're asking the 40 or so people who were tested at Lutheran between July 2nd through July 9th to go back in and get retested. Rosanna Scotto, Fox News. And still ahead on the 10 o'clock news, some comments you won't believe from a Catholic priest concerning doctors who perform abortions. A date in court for the woman accused of leaving her children home alone while she worked as a prostitute. A joyful meeting between a little girl and the man who gave her the gift of life. And Robin talked to Jean-Claude Van Damme about his new movie, Hard Target. 10 o'clock news will be right back. When it comes to adventure, nobody yeah. does it better than Briscoe. The West is a lot more exciting than I ever imagined. Premieres August 27th at 8 on Fox 5. Brought to you by the American Express card. Don't leave home without it. I learned to hit with the broomstick and ball cap. That cap would spin and curve, and that made me a good hitter. <laughs> what I enjoyed most was putting the uniform on every day. Just playing baseball. One of the greatest honors of baseball, getting in a Hall of Fame. Well, I've been American Express a member since uh, 1974. American Express is welcomed at the Hall of Fame and a lot of other places that bring out the kid in you. There was a mother on Long Island who says she left her children home alone while she went off to work as a prostitute. Well, tonight she's home alone. She's out on supervised bail. The authorities are taking care of her kids. Linda Schmidt reports. As children play in Swayze Street in Sayville, Suffolk County, some residents are shocked and others angered. Their neighbor of two months, Krista Koopman, left her children home alone for 12 hours Friday night. If she had knocked on my door, I would have 
gladly taken the children. Um, anyone in the neighborhood would have. A Suffolk County District Court judge today released Koopman on $500 bail under the probation department's supervision. She's charged with leaving her seven-month-old daughter and two-year-old son alone while she prostituted herself in New York City. She says it was for money for diapers and food. Neighbors living in this multifamily house said that they heard crying about 5 o'clock on Saturday morning, and they heard the screaming coming from the children's bedroom for about four hours, and then they called police. Officer James Lennon climbed into the bedroom window, finding the two-year-old in one crib and the seven-month-old in another. The sides had collapsed on top of the little seven-month-old baby. So she was flailing around in panic. She was trapped. The two-year-old was in a crib right beside this crib, and he was standing up, and he was frantic. He was, uh, he was going crazy, screaming, just screaming, panic. The children are now in the custody of Suffolk County's Child Protective Services. Yeah. Koopman says the children's father doesn't give her any money to help with the kids, and she says welfare cut off her assistance. The welfare department would only tell Fox News today that it did provide financial assistance to Koopman at one time. Two friends in court in Central Islip today said Koopman is a very attentive mother who unfortunately is a victim of the system. But some of her Sayville neighbors say she could have gotten free food from the town's food pantry or from any number of church programs. In addition, the Mother Center Women's Coalition, just a half a block from Koopman's apartment, could have provided daycare and other free services. Koopman will be staying with these friends until she gets back on her feet. If convicted, she faces up to two years in jail and or a $2,000 fine. In Suffolk County, Linda Schmidt, Fox News. Well, a minister found out what people in one neighborhood in the Bronx already knew. Living there can be hell. Reverend Carmelo Alvarez was a guest minister at a church on Union Avenue in the South Bronx. There was a fist fight outside. Then somebody started shooting. Reverend Alvarez was hit in both legs. He's in stable condition. Three other men were also shot. One of them is in critical condition. The gunman got away. And a priest in Alabama says killing doctors who perform abortions is justifiable homicide. Father David Trosh's views are clearly illustrated in an ad he tried to run in a paper in Alabama last week. It shows a man pointing a gun at a doctor who is apparently about to perform an abortion. The caption reads, justifiable homicide. Father Trosh says if 100 doctors need to die to save a million babies a year, it's a fair trade. A million lives against 100? Uh, I'd say any human being in right thinking mm -hmm. would believe that. Now, Father Trosh says most of his parish members will eventually agree with him on this, even though they disagree with him now. One woman told us she was taught to pray for people who perform abortions, not shoot them. It's cleanup time in Denver now that the Pope has gone back to Rome. Dozens of workers headed to Cherry Creek State Park. That's where the Pope celebrated Mass yesterday for 375,000 people. They left behind 40 tons of garbage. It'll take a few days to clean it all up. Rudolph Giuliani says if he had his way, the city's Board of Education would be decentralized, split up into five separate boards representing each of the boroughs. The Republican candidate for mayor says he will spell out all the specifics of his plan within two weeks. And New Jersey's GOP candidate for governor, Christy Whitman, paid over a million dollars in taxes last year, but Governor Florio says maybe she should have paid more on her farm. Kyung Yoon reports. Here, guys. Christine Todd Whitman got downright sloppy trying to prove she's as much at home in a pig pen as in the political arena. I'm a farmer. I'm proud to, to communicate that to the voters of the state of New Jersey. The millionaire Republican gubernatorial candidate invited journalists to tour her family's 200-plus acre property. She said to prove once and for all that hers is a working farm, complete with cows, sheep, and chickens. The invitation comes after charges from Governor Jim Florio's campaign that Whitman took advantage of tax breaks designed to help working farmers. Under New Jersey's farmland assessment law, in order to qualify as a working farm, a property must be at least five acres and produce a minimum of $500 in annual revenue. Records show that the Whitmans qualified for a tax break by selling several hundred dollars of firewood to their relatives. In non-farm income, the Whitmans earned nearly $4 million last year, but in property taxes paid just $47 on their 50-acre farm in Far Hills and just over $1,000 on more than 206 acres in Oldwick. You're obligated to meet every condition of the law, and we have done that. But a spokeswoman for Governor Florio, who was out of town at a governor's conference, said 
The issue is not about whether Whitman and her husband broke the law, but, quote, about what loopholes they use to manipulate the system. The intent of the farmland assessment law is not to subsidize the estates of millionaires. While Whitman is clearly hoping that today's tour will help stem any further political damage, it's certain that this is one issue that won't be going away anytime soon. Governor Florio's campaign is planning to run a series of ads starting this fall, focusing on Whitman's wealth and her farms. Reporting from Tewksbury, New Jersey, I'm Kyung Yoon, Fox News. Still ahead, we'll tell you why Don Imus did not make it to the studio again. An emotional meeting a little girl met the man who saved her life. We'll be right back. Only one. For the second time in two weeks, Don Imus did his radio show from a hospital bed. His right lung collapsed again yesterday while he was at home in Connecticut. He now is in stable condition and in very good spirits. He told me on the telephone tonight, jokingly, that this latest lung collapse happened when he was bench pressing Connecticut Governor Lowell Weicker. <laughs> a speedy recovery, Imus. Sounds like you're feeling better already. And it's a gift that just keeps giving. A St. Louis man gave a Long Island girl the bone marrow she desperately needed to overcome leukemia. And the two met today celebrating their bond. Mario Bosquez takes us to this heartwarming reunion. Although they just met for the first time today, these two new buddies have something special in common. Even though she is from Port Jefferson and he is from St. Louis, Missouri, their bond is a vital one, one that came to life before they ever met. I found out, I guess it was in October, that, uh, that I was a match, and I was on cloud nine. I had won the lottery. Dennis Lavely is talking about the bone marrow he donated to Alyssa Esposito's failing system. At two and a half months, she was diagnosed with a rare form of juvenile leukemia, and the desperate search for a bone marrow donor was on. The operation took place in January of 92. Alyssa now appears to be on the upswing of what was a downhill battle. Right now, we, we're not really sure, you know, what's in for the future for Alyssa, medically um, speaking, but she's doing, she seems to be doing really good now. I want to catch you. Oh, I got it. Surrounded now by friends and family, the Lavalies of St. Louis and the Espositos of Port Jefferson seem to be forever intertwined. I don't have any words. Words aren't good enough. Um, I, I think when he looks at me and he looks at his children, he knows how grateful we are. And just a big hug is, is good right now. Dennis says he was told Alyssa's chances for a donor were one in a million. He took that to heart. I gave it to her because it was very true. She's a beautiful little girl. <laughs> Just beautiful. She's great. Alyssa heads back to Seattle this weekend for what's being described as a reevaluation. Her mom says she's just plain beating the odds. So the doctors may be calling it a reevaluation. Her parents just call it a miracle. In Port Jefferson, Mario Bosques, Fox News. Wall Street had a pretty good day, thanks in part to news of a big merger, something we'll talk about in just a minute. The Dow Industrials closed up nine and a half points. Winning stocks beat the losers on the big board by a margin of three to two. The price per share was up 12 cents. Over the Amex, the price per share was up two cents. The index there was up two and a quarter points. The Nasdaq Composite was up more than eight and a half points. Now a little more about that merger we mentioned. Here's our Fox Business News report. <laughs> AT&T, the world's largest telecommunications company, and Macaw Cellular, the leader in wireless communications, are joining forces. Today, the two companies announced a stock merger deal worth close to $13 billion. If the government approves the deal, Macaw investors would get one share of AT&T stock for every share of Macaw they own. What's more, company officials say no jobs will be lost as a result of the merger. The Macaw brings the most extensive service capabilities in the wireless business. Uh, we will add to Macaw's uh, valuable franchise our own uh, powerful brand name, the Bell Laboratories, and all of its R&D resources, and of course, new distribution channels. Next month, Sears will close the book on all 67 of their catalog outlet stores. This move follows their decision back in January to stop publishing their catalog. Sears had been sending them out for 106 years. Continental Airlines is also scaling back their operation in an effort to improve their bottom line. 
Before the end of the year, they are going to lay off close to 3,000 people and cancel at least nine unprofitable routes. Finally, Donna Karen, the upscale fashion designer, is taking her clothing line to Wall Street. This fall, Ms. Karen is planning to sell 11 million shares of stock in her company. The initial asking price is expected to be around $15 a share. And that's the Fox Business News for Monday, the 16th of August. Animal rights activists are forcing the Trump Taj Mahal to change its ways after the summer, that is. The Atlantic City Casino agreed to stop its animal diving show at the Steel Pier. Protesters say at least one animal was injured diving from the 30-foot platform last week. But the resort says the show must go on through the rest of the summer because of contract obligations. All right, still ahead, how a dose of hormones could help you lose your punch. How the New York Times turned a lot of heads with its Sunday magazine. And a special date for fans of Elvis. And Robin spoke with Jean-Claude Van Damme about his new film and new love. There is lots more ahead on the 10 o'clock news. But it's a nice game because I have a challenge in life. If I can do everything... Round and round we go on the Savings Go Round. Where we stop Who needs shouting when you can get... Let me just update our top stories for you now. Then Carl and Phil have a preview of the sports and the weather. The flooding knocked out service for a while tonight on the west side IRT line around 72nd Street. Put some highways underwater. And business executive Harvey Weinstein was rescued this afternoon. He had been kidnapped and buried alive near the Henry Hudson Parkway in Upper Manhattan. He's safe at home now, and two suspects are under arrest. Carl. All right, John, coming up in sports tonight, the Red Hot Yankees cooled off by Mother Nature out at the stadium. And why so much publicity for the kid who caught Don Mattingly's ball yesterday? Enough is enough, all right? We'll tell you about that. And the Jets named their starting quarterback. Wonder who that could be. Time to name our number one guy when it comes to doing the weather. Willard Scott, I mean, uh, hey, Phil hey, Schwartz. Hey, hey. Come on. Ooh. Oh, boy. Thanks, Lynn. Appreciate it. Hey, uh, we saw quite a bit of rain in here earlier, obviously. We did see some flooding. More heavy showers and thunderstorms are yet on the way, and we could ha possibly have some more flooding problems as we head toward morning. More on that a little bit later on. Coran? Thanks. See you later, Phil. The New York Times rarely gets such strong reaction to its magazine covers, but yesterday's issue was a shocker. The cover story was about breast cancer, and the photo showed a woman's mastectomy scar. The model is Matuchka. She is an artist, and ever since her own bout with breast cancer, an activist. She told us about her mission last year on our Fox special on breast cancer called One in Nine. I think there is a reason why this happened to me, and um, I think it's pretty obvious. I mean, whether it's that I'm carrying a message or that I'm, I'm writing these articles that may enlighten or help or, or assist somebody in some small way. She now uses her art to bring more attention to the thousands of women who die of breast cancer every year. She says she was surprised the Times used the photo of her. A new development may have more people wearing patches, not just smokers who want to quit. There could be a patch with testosterone for men who want to shape up. Lynn Brown reports. If research proves to be long-term and effective, the man with the paunch hanging over his belt could get some help. Recent research shows that moderate doses of testosterone in the form of a patch, like the nicotine patch seen here, but worn on the belly, helped to redistribute fat. Men who were given low doses of testosterone by a patch that allowed it to be absorbed through their skin changed their body composition. In other words, fat that was inside their abdomen, around their organs, which we believe is likely to cause high blood pressure, a bad cholesterol level, and a tendency towards diabetes. All this improved when they were using the testosterone patches. Testosterone is a male hormone, but it is possible, according to the doctor, for testosterone to help women who also have the equivalent of a beer belly. He adds, we're talking redistributing fat, not losing it. It's actually not necessarily easier to get rid of. In fact, it may be harder to get rid of it's just in an area that puts you at less risk. While the 31 overweight men experience no side effects during the nine-month study, the research needs some further validation. So don't rush out looking for the testosterone patch just yet. I'm Lynn Brown, Fox News. 
Well, the city only has about three and a half weeks to finish getting rid of asbestos in the schools. The school year starts September 9th, and we're already hearing about one school that won't be ready, PS 133 in Brooklyn. It's going to take about 10 weeks to clean up the asbestos there. But the people say in charge this time say that when it's clean, you can believe them. Inspection teams are working around the clock to try to finish things up, but could end up costing at least $10 million. That's on top of the $7 million tax dollars that was already spent. All right, still ahead, a tribute fit for a king. Elvis, that is. Also ahead, the star of the new action flick, Hard Target. Talks with Robin about being the target of his female fans' affections. You are here. He has the traveler's checks here. There's got to be a better way. Here's one now. American Express checks for two. The only traveler's checks that either of you can use. Don't leave home without them. Ugh, oh, some son I have. Ringing me in the wee hours from America. He saves money, I lose sleep. Avoid international incidents. Introducing the most worldwide from Sprint. The only calling plan with just two 12-hour calling periods, so it's convenient to call and save. Ugh, oh, hung up. Get the most worldwide. You'll rest easy, and so will your relatives. Now get $50 free long distance with the most worldwide, only from Sprint. Lonnie Anderson says getting sued for divorce by Burt Reynolds came as a total surprise. She told Television Guide she had no idea he wanted out of their marriage until she saw the divorce papers. She denies Burt's claim in another publication that he told her the night before. And Harrison Ford is still America's most wanted fugitive among movie fans. The Fugitive took in over $22 million over the weekend, almost as much as its first week. Far back in second place, Jason Goes to Hell. It took in only seven and a half million, and it opened on Friday the 13th. Hmm, good timing, and Harrison Ford gets some competition this weekend from Jean-Claude Van Damme. Also, an all-star bash on Long Island. Robin fills us in. Well, it was definitely Hollywood in the Hamptons over the weekend. Don Johnson was just one of the A-list types who turned out for one of the summer's biggest bashes. Joan Rivers was also there for the premiere of the new HBO original movie and the band played on based on the 1987 best-selling book about the AIDS epidemic. Richard Gere, Alan Alda and Steve Martin are just some of the co-stars in the movie and the celebrities who attended the post-premiere bash at the Tony East Hampton Eatery Sapporo de Mare gave the film a thumbs up. Powerful and informative. Um, it was done with a lot of dignity. Uh, I, I was very impressed. And the band played on debuts on HBO next month. Well, his personal life has been making headlines recently, but now Jean-Claude Van Damme is back on the big screen in the Rock'em Sock'em action flick Hard Target behind the lens famed Asian action director John Woo. And this time, the 32-year-old Van Damme, who has said he has the best body in Hollywood, manages to keep all of his clothes on. Last time you and I talked, you said you were going to stop doing the semi-naked shot. Right. <laughs> and in Hard Target, we just get to see your biceps. You don't even take your shirt off. Right. There's, and I know you. There's a method behind this. We keep in, we keep in the butt shot for the sequel. <laughs> it's doing well, then I promise the producer to show my butt. Sam's new girlfriend, Darcy LaPierre, the woman he left his third wife, Gladys Portuguese, for it last year. If Van Damme marries Darcy, she will be wife number four. So is this serious? I mean, I'm a guy. I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to date. Uh, it must be hard for you to have a relationship because, I mean, let's face it, you, you know, there's lots of women out there who, like, probably want to meet you all the time. Yeah, it's kind of hard. But, I mean, if you're in love, nothing is hard. If you love somebody and you're happy, it's like, that's, you know, you cannot fight love. But Van Damme has had to fight more than love recently. In February, he was ordered to pay this man, an actor, almost half a million dollars for a stunt injury in the 1988 movie Cyborg. But Van Damme says that ruling hasn't scared him away from stunts. I've done so many fight scenes, and it happened. I mean, that's an accident. And four years ago, I was, like, broken, and then I became a star, and they wait four years to tell me if I'm wrong or right, and then they make lots of money. Van Damme, in fact, did more than half of the Daredevil stunts in Hard Target, his latest step on the road to superstardom. And he's one actor who doesn't mind admitting he likes being a sex symbol. It's great. I enjoy it. I take advantage of it. I mean, 
it's great to be wanted. Let's face it, if actors are saying to you, oh, I don't want to be wanted, I don't want to be admired, I don't, it's a bunch of, of lies. Hard Target opens on Friday as part of Van Damme's new six-picture deal with Universal, and later this year he tells me he plans to set his sights on directing. John and Coran, back to you. Alrighty, thank you, Robin. Sixteen years ago today, we heard the news that Elvis Presley was dead. Every year since then, thousands of people flock to Elvis's mansion in Memphis to pay tribute to the king, and every year they light candles, walk somberly past his grave in the garden of his Graceland mansion. Elvis was only 42 years old when he died of a drug overdose. So ahead, Phil will tell you whether or not uh, we're going to be dry in time for the morning commute. Also, the Jets solve their quarterback question. Carl has the answer. Stay with us. Early from time to time. Make sure it as you know, I'm not only the heckler president, I'm also a client. If your hair is thinning like mine was, call now for your free video. The first thing my wife said when she saw it, that I looked 10 years younger. That was the first words out of her mouth. Not hello, not hi. I feel good about myself when I get up in the morning. It's easy to maintain and manage. So call now for your free video on hair club's developments in dealing with thinning hair. It helped our clients. See how this free video can help you too. Looks like Hawaii is lucky, uh, apparently going to be spared the worst of Hurricane Fernando. The storm stayed offshore, roaring past the islands right now at more than 100 miles an hour. Made for a huge surf, though. A lot of people did pack up and clear out of their homes. People further inland, though, stayed put, but they stocked up on lots of supplies. There is the surf that I was talking about. Mm. Oh, it doesn't look that that bad. But nothing as severe for us in general, because we just had torrential rains, and I know firsthand, because I got caught out in that tonight. It wasn't a pretty sight, Phil. Yeah, it was, it was coming down pretty <laughs> to good say the for least. a while. Yeah, we picked up uh, about an inch, an inch and a half to two inches of rain in uh, just about an hour and a half. It came down in buckets, and uh, now the rain has tapered off at least somewhat. However, there are more showers and thunderstorms out there. We'll take a look at those in just a minute on radar. Today, most of the day was dry, at least in the city. There were some heavier thunderstorms over Westchester County that produced upwards of two inches of rain. We'll also take a look at that. The high today did get up to 86, the low this morning 68, record high 96, record low 55. Right now, just a few sprinkles out there officially in Central Park. 78 degrees, no, it's not 78, it's 68 degrees. 67 dew point, relative humidity 97%, and winds are out of the south at 3 miles per hour. All right, I put together this map the best that we could, at least from the rainfall amounts we've had in, we've had reported in to us, that is. And you can see right across New York City, especially Manhattan, this is the area that saw over two inches of rain. It includes just, uh, well, really the southern parts of Bergen and Hudson County. You get farther inland, lesser amounts of rain. Wayne picked up about 0.93 inches. And then there was a heavier thunderstorm earlier in the day that produced over two inches of rain from Austinine across toward uh, South Salem and then on toward Bridgeport in Connecticut. So these are the areas that saw the heavier rain. Most areas, though, did see anywhere from about a quarter to a half an inch. And I think we're all going to see a real good soaking yet tonight because we can see on our radar more showers and thunderstorms all the way back here in Pennsylvania, just tracking along the same line. So after a break for the next hour or two, some heavier showers and storms are possible as this area continues to move to the east. And the reason for it is the very moist atmosphere we have firmly in place. It really doesn't take much of a disturbance to squeeze out that moisture. And that's what's going to happen tomorrow as this frontal system approaches. Now, there is drier air back here across the Midwest, but the, the real core of this drier air is not going to get in here anytime soon. To the south of that front, that's where all the hot stuff is. The 90s will flirt with 80 degrees, but the really hot stuff I don't think is going to get in here for the next several days. Looks like temperatures should stay uh, pretty typical for this time of year. All right, our forecast for the rest of tonight, it is going to continue to be rainy off and on, maybe a few more thunderstorms. Temperatures holding steady mid to upper 60s. For tomorrow, a gray day, a few showers, still possibly a thunderstorm. Not an all-day rain, though, with highs 78 to 83. Next five days does call for at least the possibility of showers and thunderstorms. Maybe a break on Wednesday, but Thursday and Friday, I still think there'll be scattered activity with the hottest day coming on Thursday. So for right now, the heaviest of the rain is over. Well, we could see some more thunderstorms, especially once we get past, uh, say, 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. John? Alrighty, thank you, sir. Special night in Cleveland. A former Met has battled all the way back from a terrible accident. Carl's up next when we come back. Hey, Alan.
Alan Hevesy. Why? Holtzman wants to be senator, but D.O. mayor. Only Hevesy wants to be controller. Only Hevesy will audit service delivery to neighborhoods to make sure the city is fair. Only Hevesy strictly limited Wall Street contributions and favors competitive bidding for bonds. Only Hevesy means real change. Alan Hevesy. Why? A fighter for jobs. A crusader against waste. Alan Hevesy. The Democrat who's right for controller and no conflicts of interest. <laughs> Boy, those Yankees, nothing can stop. Nothing. Nothing. Absolutely. They're on their way. They are on their way. There is nothing that can stop. But not tonight. Something stopped them. Right. You want me to say it? Uh, eventually. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mad at me. Uh, the Yan <laughs> Yankees started the night tied for first place with the Blue Jays. They are on a five-game win streak, the longest of the season for the team. Their pitching's been great. Their defense has been like, well, they're playing like a bunch of demons. In a nutshell, the red-hot Yankees are red-hot and rolling. The only way to stop them, John? Uh-huh. Phil Schwartz. <laughs> Willard Scott over there. Rain on him. Oh, that's why the Willard did team. Yeah, I'm uh, mad at him. They didn't play baseball tonight. Sorry about that. First game of the three-game set with Texas play. was rained out. That's right, they would have drowned. Jeez. Jeez. First one of the year, loving the rain there. They'll have a doubleheader tomorrow, beginning at 4.05. Jimmy Key against uh, Kevin Brown. And then the second game, Melito Perez against Kenny Rogers. Now, I'm in a foul mood tonight. <laughs> Did you happen to see the kid who caught Don Maley's uh, homer yesterday at the stadium? Well, I hate to be a sourpuss about this kid's 15 minutes of fame, but enough already with the publicity on this kid, okay? The papers were saying that he helped win the game. He was the lead story in one of the 6 o'clock newscasts tonight. He made a nice catch, but please, calm down. Let's get our priorities straight. It's true that the 16-year-old Connecticut kid who idolizes Don Mattingly made the catch, but enough already with all the media attention, which seems to be a little misdirected at the time. Look closely, and you'll see that Oriole right fielder Mark McLemore was fully extended and probably couldn't have gotten any higher to make the catch if he tried. Worst case scenario, the ball hit the top of the wall, and it's a ground rule double. As for Mattingly, he likes the kid, but knows that he had nothing to do with helping the Yankees win the game. We had a little luck on the home run, and we'll take both of them. What would you see on that? Uh, I didn't see a whole lot of anything until the replay. Uh, uh, I was running, you know. It's one of those balls, if he doesn't catch it, it hits off the wall, and he's jumping for it, and you got a chance for three. So uh, I was trying to run hard and, you know, let... When you, when you see the replay, you'll see that the fan made a heck of a catch. That's right here. I, 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 I actually actually seen that. Yeah. And uh, we'll take it. And instead of singling out just one Yankee fan, how about giving all of the Yankee fans credit? Average attendance over the past 12 games, 42,746 per game, including 57,000 plus in the house that Ruth built last Saturday against the Orioles, silencing George Steinbrenner and boosting the Bombers' confidence. We're not surprised at what we're doing, and I think uh, we're right where we deserve to be. All right, let's hear it for all of the Yankee fans. All right, an emotional night in Cleveland with the return of Indian pitcher Bob Ojeda and former Met Bob Ojeda. It's his first time back in Cleveland since the boating accident that he was involved in to kill two of his teammates, the wives of Tim Cruz and uh, Steve Olam were on hand, as you see right there. But it was a tough night for Ojeda. He didn't have his stuff tonight. Roberto Alomar with a two-run shot to make a 2 nothing. Toronto in the first, and then Paul Molitor, back-to-back -back homers as he gets another one. 3-0 Toronto at that point. They go on to beat Cleveland by a 4-1 final. Toronto now leads the Yankees by half a game. Mets in Cincinnati taking on their old manager, Davey Johnson, and putting on quite a show, if I don't say so myself, tonight in Cincinnati. El Cid greeted his old manager with a few extra pounds. He, no, he really has put on a lot of weight, hasn't he? He's huge. Like a Volkswagen. Yeah. Um, it's a tough thing to do, but they got him, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. But the Mets did win the game, 6-2 to two final over the Reds. Big news, but not necessarily surprising news from Jets training camp uh, this afternoon. Head coach Bruce Coslett has made up his mind, and surprised him, no one. Ten-year veteran Boomer Esiason start, got the starting nod over third-year Browning Nagel. Oh, all righty, thank you, sir. Finally, from Sweden, some archaeologists there think that they found some chewing gum they think is about 9,000 years old. It was made from resin sweetened by honey. The teeth marks in it look as if a teenager had chewed it. Don't know if they found it on a bedpost or if it lost its flavor after all those centuries. 
Oh, John, I think we got some old Me, stuff under this no, desk. No, no. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I'll get that later. <laughs> that's our report for tonight. I'm John Harwell. And I'm Cora Ann Mahalik. We'll see you back here tomorrow night at 10. Thanks for being with us. See you then. Good night. Good night. <laughs>